So you may have remembered me saying um, a few lessons ago that the integration we've been doing so far was indefinite integration. And we said that it was indefinite because we weren't sure what kind of thing it was integrating to because of that plus C that we had at the beginning. So we're now going to be looking at something called definite integration, which actually is not going to use the plus C, OK? Definite, we're not going to have plus C anymore. Um, OK, so it says, so far, we've seen integration as the opposite of differentiation, allowing us to find out f of x when we knew what the gradient function was, f dash x. That's all we've really seen it as. And I'm quite happy to just see integration as anti-differentiation. But in practical settings, however, the most useful use of integration is that it finds the area under a graph. And I've said, remember at GCSE, for example, when you estimated the area under a speed time graph using trapeziums to get the distance. We also know that the area under speed time graphs from what we've done in mechanics tells us the distance or the displacement. So areas underneath graphs, just like that setting with speed and, dis speed and time and distance, there are many, many applications where the area under a graph, whether it's in economics, whether it's in physics, or something you might do in engineering at university, the area under a graph is as useful a property as the gradient of a graph. So they kind of come in hand in hand with each other. So I've said if you knew the equation of the curve, you could come up with what the exact area was. And I've just got a little diagram that just reminds us when you have a curve that looks like this, if you find the area underneath it, you get the distance for a speed time graph. For those of you who want to think ahead, after we finish integration, this is exactly what we will be doing in mechanics. We will be going back to mechanics, and instead of doing our graphs all with straight lines like we did before, we will be doing basically the same thing again, apart from it will be with curved lines, and we'll be using integration and differentiation. So before we do this, before we actually look at these areas under, graph, under graphs, we actually need to find out what a definite integral means um, and how we're actually going to evaluate this kind of thing that we've got here. So before we do this, uh, this is what we're going to do for a definite integral. You'll notice the thing that looks different about a definite integral are these two numbers that we have written at the top and bottom of the integration summation symbol that we have at the beginning, OK? And I've said here that these are known as limits, which give the values of x that we're finding the area in between, right? The limit that goes at the bottom is the first one that you come across when you look on the graph. The limit that goes on the top is the second one. It kind of goes, normally we look from the top to the bottom, but with integration, the bottom limit is what we call the lower limit, and the top limit is the upper limit. And you can see for this graph here, it's corresponding to the 1 and the 5. And integration of 4x cubed, this is the graph 4x cubed. When you integrate 4x cubed between these limits, you'll be finding out the area of that shaded bit with the, with the question mark in it. So what we do, we integrate as normal, but instead we put the expression in square brackets meaning we still need to evaluate the integrated expression using the limits. Now, there's nothing about maths that I need you to understand here, but this is just about how we write things down. And it is very important that you follow these rules because it's about how we communicate. It's like if you're in an English lesson and I tell you about how a word is spelt, this is how the equivalent things that we have in maths that we've got here, OK? So I'm now going to integrate this expression, which is 4x cubed. What does 4x cubed integrate to? x to the power of 4. And I close off the square brackets. I do need you to do it using square brackets, OK? I don't want this to be with rounded brackets anymore. And what we now do, and again, this is about how we learn to write these things down, is we're saying that we're going to find out what this expression is integrated with some limits. And the limits were 1 and 5. So I'm still going to have to write these limits. What changes, though, is instead of writing the limits on this side, here and here, we change and we write the limits on this side, here and here, OK? And for now, you're just going to have to trust me with, like, this is just how we do the process of how we find this. So we've now just integrated it to x to the power of 4. There is no requirement for plus c because it is definite integration. And in a moment, you might see why we don't need that plus c. And I'll see if we can explain why we don't need it for this process. Once we've got to this stage of saying that it's definite integration, the way we work this out is we take the top limit and we substitute it into the expression. And we take the, the bottom limit, the lower limit, and substitute it into the expression. And we subtract them 
in that order. So I'm just going to say that one more time. We substitute the upper limit into the expression, and from that we subtract the lower limit, subtracted, uh, sorry, sub substituted into the expression. And the way that I always want you to do this is to put them both in brackets so that we don't make any mistakes about positives and negatives. Clearly here it's not going to make a difference because substituting 5 and 1 into this is just going to give you two positive numbers. But you know how maths is. The deeper you go into a question, you start getting things with negative fractions and thirds, and eventually you'll have things with multiples of pi and all sorts of weird numbers. So I just want you to always trust me when I say, please do it this way, okay? So the first thing that we will have is you'll be substituting 5 in here. So you will have 5 to the power of 4. And from that, you will subtract 1 to the power of 4. So I've substituted in the expressions into those two separate parts there. And I'm subtracting them upper limit, take away, lower limits. 5 to the power of 4, is that 625? So it becomes 625 minus 1. So the answer is 624. Now, as a quick side note here, and I, I don't need you to write this down unless, unless this is of interest for you. If there were a plus C, if we did it as x to the power of 4 plus C between 1 and 5, We'll just show you what would have happened here. We would have had, substituting in for x, not for c, you would have had 5 to the power of 4 plus c minus 1 to the power of 4 plus c. The c's are just going to disappear, aren't they? Because you would get 5 to the power of 4 plus c minus 1 to the power of 4 minus c, and the plus c and the minus c cancel out with each other. So that's why we don't actually need to use the constant of integration when we're doing definite integration, because it just cancels itself out okay so don't do it but if you ever did it wouldn't actually make any difference at all because it just would disappear in that that case that we've got okay so we're going to have a look at um an, a different example that we have here this time my limits are between minus three and plus three and my curve is x squared plus one. Oh, there's a mistake in the way i've typed this can anybody spot what i should have done that i haven't done brackets yeah this should have been bracketed to make it clear that I was integrating the whole thing. So what does this integrate to? x squared plus 1, nice and quick. Anyone? A third x cubed plus x, good. And that is in between minus 3 and 3. Make sure your limits go on the right-hand side there, OK? <coughs> and then we're just going to do what we did before. We're now doing the substitution, so we don't need the square brackets anymore. The square brackets refer to this stage where we have the limits. So I'm going to have a third times 3 cubed plus 3. That's the first bit. Minus a third times minus 3 cubed plus minus 3. You can see what we've done there. 3 has been substituted in place of x. Minus 3 has been substituted in place of x. Now, some of you might like to type all of this into a calculator. I don't like doing that, personally. I just like looking at things and working it out myself, because I know my brain is better than my fingers, OK? Now, this is actually super easy to work out without a calculator, because if you're going to do a third of, a thir of 3 cubed, it's just going to be 3 squared, because you're thirding it. So it's just 9. So this thing here is just 9 plus 3, which is 12. And then this bit, I'm going to be a bit careful. I'm going to still leave the brackets that we've got in here. Um, <coughs> minus 3 cubed, well, it's going to be a negative number. And it's a third of that. So it's going to be minus 9. And then here, I've still got the minus 3 that I have in that place. So it becomes 12 minus minus 12, which is 24, OK? Now, you can see why I want you to do brackets minus brackets. Because by having them in brackets, it helps us to not do that thing that every single person in this class has done, including myself, which is to get a sign wrong. This is the most common mistake that people make in maths, is there's a minus when there shouldn't be, or there's a plus when there should be a minus. 
And we want to try and stop ourselves doing that. And one of the ways we stop ourselves doing that is by always doing the brackets, the minus, and the brackets. Even when you think it's the easiest thing in the world, I would appreciate you still doing that, OK? Now, I have written down here that your calculators are really powerful. They didn't used to be able to do this. But the new models that you've got, the class -wiz ones, the black and, black and white kind of calculators and the graphics calculators, you can actually type this expression that you've got here straight into your calculator, and it will give you the answer. Now, I have written here, you can only use this to check your answer. It makes it crystal clear in the textbook. There's a little box in the textbook that says, watch out. If you do these on your calculator in the exam, you will get no marks. You must show this process here. At least, you definitely need to see this, and the examiner definitely needs to see this. That bit, that, that, and that, not super important, OK? But if they can't see that, and they can't see that you know how to do limits, you're getting zero marks. But you can do that in your calculators. So um, I'll come around later. If any of you can't find those buttons on your calculator, I'm sure you're all pretty good at finding it. Um, as long as you type in the limits the, the, the cor correct way and you type that in, it should be fine. Okay? So we're going to only use that to check your answers. But you should use it to check your answers. Now, before we do some practice here, I want to go straight in at the deep end with a much more challenging kind of question that we've got here. Okay, This is the kind of thing that you would come across in an exam by itself. This kind of question may be like within a bigger question, Okay, just doing limits. But this question could be an exam question um, of its own right by itself. So we're going to do this question here, and we'll then do a bit of practice, and we'll see if we can squeeze in another exercise as well. Okay. So. Given that capital P here is a constant, and we would call this the integral of 2px plus 7 between 1 and 5, or we could say with respect to x, with the, the limits 1 and 5. It's a long thing to say here. You can see why maths likes to write things down super simple. Given that the integral of that thing with these limits is 4p squared, show that there are two possible values for p and find these values. Well, how are we even going to start doing that? It just all feels a bit overwhelming when I've got this thing. I've got this thing, and I know that it's equal to 4p squared. Well, I would look at this, and I should think, OK, well, this thing here looks like something I can just do, right? So I'm going to ignore this 4p squared thing. I'm actually going to just work out what this integrates to, and then afterwards, I might see the fact that it's also equal to 4p squared, whether that might help me do something here. Okay. Now, it's with respect to x. So let's actually just work out what this integrates to using its limits here. Um, Nabil, what does 2px plus 7 integrate to with respect to x? Px squared. Good. P, Px squared plus 7x. Close off those brackets. And the limits are 1 and 5 here. <coughs> Remember, p is just a constant, and we're doing it with respect to x anyway, so it's not going to affect it. It's just going to stay as a, as a constant there, right? And now we're going to evaluate this integral. When I say evaluate in maths, evaluate should always end up with like a numerical answer. So if I say evaluate this integral, Actually, this isn't going to end up with a numeric, uh, numerical answer, but it means work it out for in maths. So I'll substitute in 5. Remember, this whole question has been done with respect to x. So 5 and 1 will get substituted in the place of x. <coughs> so big brackets, p times 5 squared plus 7 times 5 minus p times 1 squared plus 7 times 1. So you get 25p plus 35 minus p plus 7. OK. 
And obviously here, I didn't need to write brackets around the beginning bit because they're both positives. This whole thing is positive. But I've kept the bracket here to remind me it's going to be a minus p and then it's going to be a minus 7. So I get 25p plus 35 minus p minus 7, which is 24p plus 28. So we've worked out that this is equal to this, but what else is it also equal to? It's also equal to 4p squared. So I must think this thing must be equal to 4p squared. So 24p plus 28 is equal to 4p squared. Why am I happy it's a quadratic? What does it say in the question that makes me happy? Two answers. It says there's two values of p. Great, it's going to be a quadratic. So make everything equal to 0. 4p squared minus 24p minus 28. I mean, you could either put it in your calculator or you could factorise it. How much is it? 7 minus 1. So p is equal to 7 and p is equal to minus 1. Those are the two possible answers that we could have for this one. Okay. And then just before I pause the video at this point, there's just one more thing I want to speak to you about before I send you off to do a few questions. Yeah, I think it's 7 and minus 1. Yeah. So the only other thing that you might come across in these questions, okay, is, and I'm wanting to just make you think ahead to this, is you might have something where the limits are letters. They might have said something like, I don't know, given that between 1 and A of 2x plus 7 dx equals 3a squared... They might have done something like this, okay? They might give you an equation where you've got an unknown thing in the limit as well. Well, just substitute in that when you would normally have substituted in 5. Instead of substituting in 5, just substitute in A in this particular case. So just because I haven't shown you exactly every single way that these questions might come up, you just need to remind yourself... These things refer to the limits, so I'll just be substituting them in. I don't care if it said 5 or whether it said a plus b. If it said a plus b, I'll substitute a plus b in that place that we've got there, OK? So I'm going to ask you just to do a few of these questions, and we'll do these on the whiteboards so that we're um, a little bit less quiet, and I'll write them down now, OK?